So, uh, Joanna is a New York-based Salvadoran artist and founder of the Unapologetically Street series, a series created to highlight and utilize space for people of color in the arts. She has shared her work in communities through throughout the country and speaks at the universities on the importance of study of storytelling and revolutionary acts of healing through art. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Vice, Huffington Post, Teen Vogue, New York Times, and others. Uh, so let's get uh, let's all welcome Joanna Torunio to our uh, all of our classes in the set community. Thank you so much for having me. This is such weird times. I can't believe that in 2020, the year that I thought was going to be like such a lit, good, wholesome year, we're doing this in these chaotic times. But I'm so grateful to share the space with you, even virtually. I hope to make my way to San Antonio one day. I know Texas has bomb lit energy, so I'm really excited to make my way there. Thank you for being here. Today is Tuesday. If you're keeping up with what day it is, you're doing super great. I'm not doing so well at that myself right now because I feel like the days are kind of jumbling together. So you guys probably have it together a little bit more because you have classes, so you're doing great. Um, but I'm just here to talk to you today a little bit about my work and myself um, as I was introduced. My name is Johanna Taruno, and I'm the creator of the Unapologetic Street series, which is basically a multimedia series, uh, a body of work that takes up public space and has done so from the conception of the series. But to tell you about that, I have to tell you a little bit about myself. So um, I was born in San Salvador, El Salvador in the late 80s, 1989 to be exact towards the end of the civil war, towards the end of a lot of political crisis in my country in Central America. Um, I was born towards the end of the civil war, but I still experienced the aftermath of it. And that was intense, but it was, a really, it was really beautiful for me to grow up in my country and to be able to have the time that I did until I was forced to leave um, when I was almost 10. So my birthday is in December and I came here when I was nine in November. So basically 10 years old. I didn't speak the language. I didn't speak English at all. I came here without like not even knowing one word or the fact that I was moving here permanently. Um, my mom told me that I was coming to visit her because my mom had been here already for six months. So this was kind of like a reunion for my mom and I. And I thought that I was just coming here to see her and then we were gonna go back home. I don't know, I was a child. And I came with a little book bag, you know, it was like a little carry-on book bag with a few toys and um, like my favorite sweater and that's it, um, aside from like my luggage. But after that, I never went back home and that was 20 years ago. Um, so that's intense. But because of all of that, in my experiences growing up here, growing up in Richmond, Virginia, after we moved around a lot, um, experiencing like four years in the juvenile system where I was incarcerated from a young age from when I was like 15. And then I spent until I was almost 18 on probation. So like all of that really created this displacement, this, um, this need to communicate with folks. Um, and it stemmed from my childhood coming here at a young age and not knowing the, not knowing the language. Um, it really forced me to realize that I wasn't the only person that was feeling this way, this displacement, this migration experience that I had as a child. I've never been one of those that was like, oh, you know, is there anyone that feels the way that I do? Because I know that there were people that felt the way that I saw them. I saw them every day. I saw them in the street. I saw them in my communities. And I just had to find a way to communicate with people. Um, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm hella introverted. I don't like to be outside like that. Um, I don't really like to have attention on me. So I don't know, the fact that I do this for a living now, public speaking is like crazy and it blows my mind. But, um, you know, the series came from wanting to create a body of work that spoke to people in a manner that I didn't necessarily have to be the one speaking. So when I was growing up, I saw a lot of political work in my country um, with the Civil War. And I saw a lot of political art out of, that was born out of necessity from community to communicate their feelings in a way that was in a large scale, in a way that was accessible, and in a way that spoke to folks. Um, so political art is just in my blood. Um, and I decided to create 
a small poster and go out on the street. And that was the very beginning. I'm gonna go to the next slide. So the beginning of the series was actually a SoundCloud project. It was me recording myself on my phone or on my computer, like reciting like spoken word poetry, but not. It was just basically like my thoughts and my feelings. And, you know, like not only was I not very good at that because it wasn't my vibe, but also like I, if you go around telling people to listen to your SoundCloud link, they're probably not going to, no shade, but it's just, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're listening as I say this, you know, it's true. Like if somebody comes up to you and they're like, hey, you listen to my SoundCloud link, they're probably going to tell you no. So, or not even tell you no, but like, like shake their head, totally be like agree with you or whatever. And then they're like, not actually going to do it. So I decided that all of that put to the side. One day it just occurred to me that I should make a poster. And by that, I mean, take a computer sized piece of paper and type out something super basic on my computer that said, stop fetishizing, fetishizing black and brown bodies and put it on the street. There was nothing else to it, no flowers. Like you, if you're familiar with my work now, you've seen, there was none of that because at the time I didn't have the tools or the knowledge to know how to do that. So I was on Google, I was on YouTube and I was like, how do people make advertisements for the streets? Because in the beginning, you know, I was seeing all these huge advertisements in New York City. And I was seeing these huge Calvin Klein posters and I was touching the paper and I was touching the wall and I didn't know what kind of paper it was and I didn't know how they were, what glue they were using. But for me, it was, I was on Google and I was looking it up. And obviously it led me to wheat pasting and street art. And I stumbled on an old video from like 1996 of Shepard Ferry, who was the creator of Obey. And he was in his garage and he was making wheat paste. He was making a mixture of glue that he was taking out on the streets. So I basically just replicated what Shepard did in the video upstairs. I ran to my roof and I found these two wooden pallets. They were like this, you can't see it, like this big, much bigger, whatever. And I created the wheat paste in my kitchen. It was flour and it was some other shit. And I just ran upstairs. I wheat pasted my first poster that I created with actual flowers on it of Khalif Browder. And if you're not familiar with Khalif Browder, I highly encourage you to get familiar with his story. Um, but I realized that the glue worked and the paper worked, the poster worked. So I just ran with it and I went back out on the street and I started to create posters that were colorful. Um, but all in all, the whole point was to communicate with people, you know, to, to create something that spoke to people on the streets that was created intentionally for them, queer people of color and people of color. Um, so that's where the series came out of, you know, a SoundCloud project that turned into a multimedia public installation. And this is me on the street. If you don't know what it looks like, if you've never seen my work, it looks something like this. Um, Something that's really important for me to like kind of stress to people is that street art was created by people of color um, in the hood. And that is inherently political in the same way that um, different movements, liberation movements across the world have used street art and um, poster art specifically to communicate with the folks in their communities in their own backyards. Um, we're talking about from the Young Lords to the Black Panther, from Palestine to El Salvador around the world, people have used poster art and political art in public to express themselves, to communicate and to censor their own um, in this large scale. And I lived in New York very specifically. So for me, it was that we were seeing these huge, okay, wait, I should have, no, 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 I'm just gonna leave it like that. Sorry. So for me in New York, when you're taking up, when you're seeing the walls outside of the, you know, of the homegrown art or the artists on the street, there's a lot of ads and there's a lot of European standards of beauty that are being centered and messages that are being sent to youth and being sent to people in general through these posters. Um, and I think that sometimes we don't think about the difference and the 
how how much it affects us to see this content on a daily basis um, when we don't even really think about it. So again, if you're not familiar with my work, this is what it looks like. It's large scale posters on the street with political messages that are usually in pink, soft palette colors. Um, they're always going to have floral uh, tones to them. And when I, when I tell folks, the reason why I use floral is if you're Latinx, then you may know what I'm talking about, but our families love fake flowers and they love those little magnets of fruits. So my mom loved the magnets and my mom loved the little 99 cent store flowers. And I remember when I first came here, there was a lot of conflict between my mother and I because I was upset with her that she didn't tell me that I would be moving here. So I think in her own way, she was trying to find a way to connect and to make our space feel more homey. And in her way, that was to buy those 99 cent flowers and to have huge um, like flower vases with a lot of flowers and to try to make it colorful. And for that reason, I think now flowers in general are just so beautiful and important to me. But I also believe that flowers and, you know, and their femininity Folks want to, you know, some people want you to believe, the patriarchy wants you to believe that femininity and power can't go hand in hand. That's absolutely not the case. It doesn't even go hand in hand, it is one hand. Um, so I wanted to reflect the power of femininity through really powerful political messages like the wording, um, police brutality is gun violence, gun control must hold the state accountable um, behind some cute pink roses, you know? Um, so that's what the work looks like on the street, if you have not seen it. Um, this is, these are two posters and specifically if you see the flowers next to them, those are uh, flower frames that I created myself. And I went to the 99 cent store like my mom did back in the day and I bought the similar flowers that she would buy and I created frames that would go along with the work to kind of enhance that experience for people and to enhance that um, the art in itself and for the and the people that I was honoring in those pieces. So I just like to kind of have those two side by side where I tell people where the 99 cent flowers, where like the flower uh, inspiration com comes from so that later when they see the actual flowers, um, there is that, you know, continuity. Um, okay, so next. Something I also talk about because it kind of happened naturally and organically is that when I first started this series, I didn't have an Instagram for it. And the purpose of it was for it not to exist on Instagram or social media or in the internet in general. It was for it to exist in public space in the streets, in my community, where I knew that people were going to be interacting with it. It wasn't until I was on the street one day and I was putting up posters and I ran into these kids that um, were putting up their own posters for their organization for a community festival that they were throwing. And they happened to mention seeing one of the posters that I was putting up. And, you know, mind you, they had no idea that I was the one doing it. And I, I just overheard them talking about it. And I realized that if I gave a space for folks to come and kind of come together after seeing the work on the street, then maybe it could create its own hub, its own, you know, its own community center where the poster leads you to something else. You know, I, I think that it's really powerful when we're walking down the street or in general or wherever, whatever, when we see something that speaks to us as people, as queer people, as people of color, because the media and society wants to decenter us from what is important when we're, I mean, culturally, queer people of color are culture makers. And so to me, it's really important for you to have an experience seeing something that was created intentionally um, by somebody that may share experiences that you may. So I decided that I would create an Instagram page for it because I could put the handle, you know, the, hat, the handle of the Instagram at the bottom of every poster so that when you saw one on the street, if you felt like it, if you were inspired to, if you cared enough to follow the work, you would go on Instagram 
and you would look it up and you would find a whole community of people who were there for the same reason. So when it first started, you know, I, I think that the only people who were following me on Instagram were like my friends and family and people who were slowly starting to see these posters on the street. And as time went on, now we have a community of like 140,000 people on Instagram. And I, this work has turned into something that I have never envisioned. But like I said, and I tell people all the time, Instagram is not my platform. Instagram is my mic and the streets are my platform. So I tell people all the time, what are you using Instagram for? And I think that for me, it's like, you have to be mindful of the fact that social media is a really powerful tool and we can use it for a lot of different reasons and we can use it in a lot of different ways. But for me, it was about finding a way to meet the street and social media and kind of bring them together so that we could create this kind of ecosystem where this work has a life outside of the streets if you can't access it. If you're not in New York or, you know, I take this work around the country now, so I'm able to pace up in different areas, but I'm only in one place, right? So Instagram has been life-changing and I do believe that Instagram has also uh, really, really helped me move myself into this position where I'm here now with you, right? Um, so shout out to that, shout out to the Instagram community. But I really wanted to be mindful of the fact that this work and my work is about working with people in the actual communities, right? And places that I'm actually taking up space. Um, so for me, it was about taking this beyond the internet and creating space in real life too. So that's how the community work began. Um, we did a pop-up in, I think it was 2007, 2016, 2017. I don't know, 2017, I think, in August, where it was the first time that we were creating an event based on the Unapologetic Street Series. And I had no idea what to expect. You know, I didn't know if people were going to show up. I didn't know if people, if there's going to be like five people there. But we had over 100 people come to the first event in Brooklyn. And we were so packed that there were no chairs. It was like standing room only where there was a, a panel between myself and my partner, um, who was my friend at the time, who was just going to help me talk about the work that I was creating on the street, which was really new still. I had only been doing it for like six months before we had our first event. Um, and it was the most life-changing experience because it proved to me that the streets are listening and the people are always paying attention. So after that, I started teaching workshops. I started teaching workshops based on the things that I had taught myself how to do on the internet, like wheat paste, um, like the history of poster art, how to make the posters, because I just wanted for one day, you know, like for our youth to have accessible tools on, to learn how to do something that they created, but has been so severely whitewashed. The gentrification of street art is so real, y'all. Like if you're from a place where street art is really prominent, then you've probably noticed that you're seeing street art now being used as a way to commercialize product. Because people know, companies know, brands know that people are always listening to what the street is is doing so yeah you know teaching these workshops i got a phone call from the met and the metropolitan art museum in new york and they were like hey can you come teach a workshop and i was like the met like i'm not gonna lie i had never even been there like inside i had been to the steps because it's really you know gossip girl but I had never been inside because I thought that the Met was hella expensive. Like I thought it was like $25 to get in there. And I know that that sounds like not a lot of money, but to me at the time it was, especially to go into an institution where I didn't really feel comfortable anyway, because that's the thing about museums also and art galleries is that they're inherently made to make people of color feel uncomfortable. Um, there's a lot of class, you know, classism and elitism in, in, in the arts. So that's another reason why I wanted my work to take up space um, on the street because everyone has access to it, um, not just some. So taking this work, creating community work um, outside of it, um, passing these tools down to folks um, and really making this art as accessible as I can possibly make it 
um, while it being not perfect, not everything is going to be 100% accessible because there are some folks that aren't not outside. They're not able to be outside. There are folks who don't have access to Instagram. So just being really mindful of the fact that that's, that is the case. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I do want to show everybody a video of a pop-up from Los Angeles. Now, this is, once we did the pop-up in Brooklyn, I realized that as the work gathered more attention and we had followers from all over the country and specifically the West Coast, I wanted to take my work to the West Coast and start pacing up and creating a community space like we did in New York. So the cool thing about LA is that I have a lot of personal history with Los Angeles in general, but I wanted to do something different there. I wanted to create a space where we could hire only women and have plant-based food, um, have an environment where it was like a block party, like New York, um, taking a block, block, sorry, a block style party in New York and just going to LA um, and just finessing it because that's what you do. But I'm going to push play and see if it works. Um... Hold on, y'all. We're going to change this real quick so you can see better. No, I'm sorry, y'all. I don't know why I did that. If you want me, breathe me, you make me everyone and everything. On your knees, say your prayers to me. Care for me, don't be scared of me. Worship me, you bow down to me. Look up to me, you give it out to me. You make love to me whenever I need. Whisper soft and sweet, I am everything. Everything. I go look at it and see that. Okay, so yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm like almost getting teary out right now because I miss the world so much and I miss like just being out in the streets so much. But that was a black party that happened in LA out of putting a street poster, putting this little piece of paper on the street that I had no idea would grow into something that could create a legitimate community for people. And so I just wanted to share that with you because when I tell people, you know, we did this event, I think sometimes people, um, it's easy to imagine something, but I really wanted to, for you to see the people in the video because these are real people that have been touched or influenced or um, moved by, street art and so i wanted you to see that physical that face so um i think that next what i wanted to talk about was what it looks like for you to become your own storyteller what it looks like for you to utilize the tools or whatever tools you may have um, everybody has a story to tell everybody has something to share and it just looks differently you know i think that for us um, specifically for people of color we're in a, you know, everybody has a place in the revolution. You just have to find your place there, your way there, what it looks like for you. Um, so something I always remind myself is that people are going to try and tell your story for you. Most of the time they're gonna get it wrong. So we have to honor ourselves to the best of our abilities, to what our capacities allow of honoring our truths, right? So how can we tell your own story? How can we become our own future narrators through generations, through social media, through public art, through whatever it looks like for you? Um, how can you create your own content that inspires those or impacts those around you? Um, for me, it's also been really important to collaborate with folks 
and the spaces that I'm visiting um, with this work, I've taken it nationally now, and it's been really powerful for me to go into communities that I'm not necessarily from, but also understanding that I have a privilege and that I have a responsibility to honor those communities when I enter them. So being really mindful of that, um, using community voices, um, and also being really mindful, and most importantly, this is what I really, really want to like acknowledge here, is when to understand that you have privilege and what those privileges look like to you, being really mindful of being really honest with yourself and figuring that out. Um, because I think sometimes as people, we're really afraid to acknowledge what our privileges are, um, but you have to figure them out and weaponize them so that you can use them to help folks without those privileges. Um, and when to pass the mic, most importantly. So adding community voices, working with the people around you, um, if that's what it looks like for you, but really taking a look into yourself and, wonder, and just trying to figure out how you can be of service for people um, within your capacity, obviously. Always taking care of yourself, which is really important. And something else I also cover when I do these talks is that there has to be a really conscious responsibility when you're creating public content. Um, something that I've learned and have been really mindful of since I started doing the work that I do is that as harmful as ads and commercials can be, we have to be mindful that so can street art and we have to be responsible of what we're placing on the street. So for me, it's been about being really conscious from the conception to creation of what I'm doing. Um, when folks are not in the center of the narrative that you're creating and you don't have those experiences, it isn't genuine or honest and that's the thing people know you know i was watching something with my girlfriend yesterday and we were noticing how corny this tv uh this scene and this tv show was because it was like a, a whole scene with lesbians at this bar and i'm like i guarantee you there was not one lesbian writer on that on that team because it was just so terrible and it's totally biphobic so like Queer people and just people in general who are living these experiences need to be at the head of the table of that, of whatever you're doing. Um, and that's how we have situations like, obviously I can't see you, so I can't ask you, but if you're familiar with like the Kendall Jenner Pepsi ad, which was, can you, can you believe like somebody had to, so many people had to approve that. Like somebody sat in a room and said, yes, I really think this Kendall Jenner commercial with, with the police is just going to be a great hit. We're going to have amazing responses to this. Absolutely not. And that happens all the time, everywhere. Like people are not put into power positions that can make these can, that can make these decisions to go. This this is terrible. No, don't do this. Um, so that's you know something that's really really mindful and something that's really important to also acknowledge. Um, if you are thinking of going into the public arts. Um, because think about it, are you perpetuating the oppression of folks in a commercial or ad? What are you perpetuating? Are you being conscious of what you're saying when you're creating public content? So it's just being really mindful of that and being mindful of that as street artists, I think of myself as kind of like a public servant, right? Kind of this person that goes outside and I, and I create this body of work with my community in mind. So I also have to be accountable to my community and people have to be able to say to me, hey, uh, what's, what's going on? We're, you know, what are we doing here? And when that time comes and when it has come, I have to be able to have a conversation of saying, this is, you know, so-and-so. So just being mindful that if you're creating something where our large scale of people are being impacted, you have a responsibility. Um, so that is something that I like to cover in these talks. Um, next is Niña Sin Vergüenza. I love to talk about this uh, at schools and in general. This was a street gallery. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm uncomfortable in art and formal art settings and settings where art um, isn't necessarily the center point, rather, but rather the people that are in the room. Um, I don't like settings where people are going around and it's like, who's the most popping person? Who's the most popular person? Because I just, it loses the integrity for me. Um, I'm also an introvert, so these, these spaces were not going to be for me. So I wanted to have a proper street 
gallery installation. And what I mean by that is if you saw my other work, my other posters, then you saw that they're political text-based posters. These, however, were a series of photos that were taken of my partner and I um, in hopes and the intention of this gallery was to create a body of work on the street that highlighted and centered queer love that wasn't fetishized or sexualized. Um, these were photos that were genuinely taken um, of a real couple that was really in love. And the photos were not sexual. They were not, um, they were just loving. You know, they were loving photos of a queer couple. And to me, that's what I wanted to create. I wanted to create something that was just a normal, affectionate, stay at home, you know? And these photos were taken and when I, after we took the pictures, I, I looked at them and I was like, wow, these are so cute. But we're actually together, you know? And I told my partner that I wasn't really sure if I wanted to put them up on the street anymore because it seemed kind of self-serving <laughs> to have these posters, huge posters of us on the street but she very, very quickly reminded me that I was wild and, and that there was a greater intention to, to the photographs and to the idea of the project. So I actually had them printed the next day. And we went out together and put up these large, these large posters. As you can see, she's right there, mad cute. Um, and putting up these posters together was really really life-changing for me and really revolutionary in my opinion, because as a queer couple going down, going to New York and the Lower East Side and putting up these pictures together in daylight, which I always do, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but I always put up my work in the daytime because I don't like to go out at night and do it because I feel like if I'm going outside at night, I'm kind of perpetuating this idea that my work is illegal and that it should be seen as a disruption or it should be seen as something that's wrong. So I like to go out in the daytime where I can see community members, where I can see the male lady, where I could see the lady from the salon standing outside same time every day. So these people know me, you know? People know me in the street for putting up posters. So my girlfriend and I, when I went to the Lower East Side, put up these posters. And as you can see right here, this tag on the right, um, it's a proper museum tag with the credit, the dimensions of the work. And I really wanted it to look like you were in a museum space, but you were, you were out in the street. So that's why Niña Sin Vergüenzas was created. And if you don't speak Spanish, Niña Sin Vergüenza means girls without shame. And that's a, that's a title for it that my partner and I came up with because Something that we both heard growing up a lot when we were growing up was our mother say to us, niña sin vergüenza, which is basically saying like, girl, have you no shame, basically. And shame is like a really popular emotion in Latinx communities, which blows my mind. But um, so that's where that title came from. And that's where that uh, entire gallery was born out of the need and the want to just create a space for queer people to have a normal, beautiful sign of affection. Um, that wraps up my presentation, but I'm here to share space with y'all and to really have um, some space with you and to have questions. I saw already that there's some questions to the right. So let me scroll back up and, uh, okay, perfect. Do you feel that, art, that artwork can speak louder than words to viewers? Does it allow for the message to speak for itself? Yeah, you know, I think that everybody's gonna have a different um, experience with my work or with art in general. Um, and for me, it was about letting these posters speak for themselves, for people have to have their own experiences with the posters. And that's why it's really powerful for me, at least, to be able to go out and put up the posters because I kind of feel like after I leave the poster on the street, it has its own life. It has its own experience. And I'm, I'm not there to see it and I'm not there to have those experiences with it. So it definitely speaks for itself. Um, there's another question. Wait, I like the, somebody said gentrification is a huge issue in our communities. If you all haven't seen the TV shows Vita and Hentified, they cover this issue very well. Yeah, that's true. Hentified is really good. Vita is really good. 
Um, Hentified actually got some of my artwork for their show and my partner and I went to see them in LA. We got to go on set. Um, I know the people who created Hentified are really, really great people. So definitely watch Hentified Vita as well. Um, Tanya is an awesome showrunner and creator. Um, have I incorporated Spanish language into my work? You know what? I haven't. And that's, mm, I was going to say that's for a good reason, but honestly, the only reason is that obviously Spanish is my first language, so it's not about not knowing the language, but it's about comfort also. And what the, the like the two times that I have created Spanish centered work, different people speak Spanish differently. So people are like, oh, shouldn't you say it this way and that? And I'm just like, okay, um, I'm just not going to do this for right now. So um, I have had some work translated so that folks had access. So when I created some work around COVID-19, I had it translated so that I could release it in Spanish and in English. So yeah, if there's any other questions, I'm here. You mentioned being a Capricorn at the beginning of your presentation. Is astrology important to you? Did you grow up with it? Astrology is extremely important to me. I mean, so important to me that if it had been up to me and we had been in person, depending on how many of you there were in the room, I may have asked you to go around and share your names and your signs with me because it, I always love knowing what people um, what people's signs is, even though I don't really can't know that much about you through your sun sign only. But yeah, astrology is super important. I didn't grow up with it in terms of like was like my parent, like my mom being into it now. But my mom didn't watch Primer Impacto every day or like just Univision all the time. My mom was a, a war journalist. So my mom had the news on like basically like 24 seven. And I would catch uh, Walter Mercado talking about astrology and I never missed it. And when Capricorn time came, I always listened very intensely. So yeah, it is still really important to me. Anybody else, any other questions, comments? What do you plan to do once COVID-19 is resolved more or less? Honestly, the only thing that has really changed for me as far as my work is concerned since COVID has been obviously like my, my university schedule, like my universities have, all of my events have been canceled, but also going out into the street. Um, I haven't been putting up posters because I've just thought that it was more responsible for me not to. But as time goes on, I'm starting to wonder when I'm gonna go back out. Um, but I'm working on a book right now. My partner and I have just signed a literary contract with an agent. so. We're working on a book. Um, I'm also working on another photo book. I have plenty of projects to work on. That is not the problem. The problem is that I have to do them all. <laughs> so yeah, achieving these projects in the time of COVID-19 is the actual goal. Not finding new ones because I have enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's my partner who's also here because we work together in the same space. Um, yeah, if anybody has any other questions, you know, San Antonio, I'm here with you. Who inspires you as an artist or personally? Um, well, people in my community inspire me. Like I told you, like the male lady, the salon ladies, the, you know, the bodega dudes that are always saying hi to you. Everybody that... No, for real, like everybody that makes my community is inspiring to me because everybody has their own individual experience and specifically where I grew up in a very non-white community, everybody had a really um, experience that I felt like I could relate to in some level or another. Um, so for me, it's the people that I surround myself with, community members and also my friends, my homegirls, my, my friends that are artists and creating their work. Um, those are my inspirations. My partner, who works so much um, to do what she does. So being around people who are passionate about what they do, and not in a capitalistic way, like, oh, work, 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 but people who are just love what they do. So whenever people, like, I, I meet people, I don't ask them what they do. I'm like, oh, what do you do for a living? I usually ask, what moves you? 
because I think that that's a more relevant question. Any advice that you want to give us, you want to give to us students? Yes, first of all, you're doing great. You're surviving or you're at least existing in an institution that was not created for you. You know, academic spaces were not meant for people of color. And I think that it's really important to acknowledge that by being here, by getting through this, you're doing something that was inherently not meant for you. So I'm, I'm hella proud of you. And I think that um, whatever this journey looks like for you, um, just know that you're not alone and that you have a community of people who are with you and your ancestors are with you. And you know, not everybody has good ancestors. So I don't like that whole flag or no, my ancestors bullshit. But for real, like not just your family ancestors, but your ancestors as a community in general. Um, the Unapologetically Brown Series Instagram page. You recently posted a Baby Yoda poster. Do you believe that popular media today is still dominated and gatekept by cis hetero men? Oh, absolutely. Especially like with like sci fi and like, um, all of that, I feel like cis hetero men can't handle it uh, when like non them people are into it, but it's just crazy because sci-fi was literally created by a black woman, so I don't wanna hear it. Um, baby, yeah, so I love my baby Yoda posters because it really pisses them off. <laughs> I saw your campaign with Nike, I just wanted to say that's so cool, congrats. Isn't that crazy? Like that's what I was telling you earlier, that it really blows my mind that out of posters on the street and out of my want to create something that spoke to people outside of just myself, all of this has turned into all of this. And now I did a campaign with Nike and I talked to Nike about my work and it blows my mind. What has it been like to talk about and show your work in academic settings versus in community workshops? Um, that's a good question actually, because I tend to feel more nervous in academic settings, obviously, than community workshops, but that's not because of the people. I like I don't get nervous because of students. I get nervous because I'm like, damn, like this is to see the actual infrastructure of these schools. Like when I go to these physical like universities and I see the money, literally the money, the spaces, I'm like a little intimidated. But um I feel really powerful when I'm there too, you know, because I'm a high school dropout and I didn't finish school the way that I would have wanted to. And so for me now to go into these schools that would not have let me in, like, you know, who wouldn't have admitted, admitted me, it's kind of like, okay, I'm here to take this paycheck. I'm here to talk to these students. So that is really powerful. Um, how long does your artwork stay up? Do you face issues with people removing it or defacing it? It totally depends on where it is. Um, Defacing it, of course, there's hella racist people on the street. I mean, people deface the work as as fast as it gets put up sometimes. Um, the first time I put up this Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez poster, I already knew that I was going to have to put it up really high because people either love or hate AOC. And this was a large three-foot poster, so I didn't want to just put up this poster and then like it being destroyed right away because... Some of these posters, like the like large posters, I paid like $25, $30 for to have huge posters printed out. So I didn't want them to get messed up right away. I borrowed this ladder from these construction construction workers in Soho. I basically was like, hey, can I borrow your ladder? They were like, what do you want a ladder for? And I was like, well, I, I don't want to tell you because like, you know, just I'll bring it back and nothing will happen. And even if something does happen, like you won't even know about it. So just forget about the liability. <laughs> Um, so we put up the poster like eight, nine feet so that people couldn't reach it. Um, and still like three weeks later, somebody defaced it. So I know that it's going to happen and it doesn't bother me because that's part of the, the life of creating public work um, is that the public sometimes going to have their own opinions, but it is what it is. How does it feel to see your work being thrown up across the U.S.? It's amazing. You know, I think that's why definitely why I created the accessible folder on my website was, was so that people would have access to posters because I'm not able to be everywhere all the time. And um, by putting up these posters downloadable for free, other people in other communities that felt inspired to go down the street that didn't necessarily want to make posters could have 
a body of work already. Um, so that was really important for me to also just kind of give people the posters that I was putting up to give them the access to do them themselves if they wanted to. And they have, and it's been powerful. I just had somebody in Germany put up, um, like two months ago, somebody in Germany went and put up these huge posters, these huge, like, um, I think it's like three or four of them. They're like four feet tall. One of them was of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, which is actually crazy because all the way in Berlin. But um, yeah, it's powerful. And it it means a lot to me that people would want to take the time to go do what I do, but not of their work, but of mine, you know? So yeah. Anybody else, anything else? No. You guys have had some really good questions. Thank you so much. These have been awesome. Mm -hmm. And I really do would like, I would love to make my way to San Antonio soon. Um, I think Texas has really good energy. Can I meet them? How do you feel starting up in a city like New York has influenced your ability to have your voice heard? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, creating this work in New York, I think is definitely one of the reasons why it's also helped me kind of create this larger platform because if I had been putting up these posters, I don't know, maybe in like the middle of nowhere, who has, who's seen them? But at the same time, when I created this work, it wasn't about a platform. It was literally about just having something to say. But being in New York is, has, was also very helpful in terms of having the privilege to get the attention of I think the first time that I really noticed big media was Refinery29 posted a, a picture of one of my posters because one of their editors had walked down the street and seen it. And she took a picture of it and posted it on Refinery29. And that's one of the biggest, one of, like the first big media push that I got was through Refinery. Um, and then other people seeing it, other editors, other writers that wanted to talk to me about the work um so yeah many in the lgbtq plus community believe that pride has been too commercialized these days how do you feel about that um yeah absolutely i mean pride in its celebration has been commercialized like we talked about earlier the gentrification of things and that's the same thing there it's the gentrification of pride because pride was a brick that was thrown by women of color and non-binary people of color for a revolutionary, for a revolution. So, you know, when you have like trans people, people of color who are creating a revolution, who is who now we have like NYPD cop cars who have their rainbow flags thrown on, on the doors. It just blows my mind because I'm like, how did we get to a point where we have the actual oppressor, the people who were raiding Stonewall, now having carrying their rainbow flag on their car. So yeah, it has actually been commercialized, but we also shouldn't forget um, the meaning and the true history of what pride was, which wasn't really pride. It was a call of survival at the time. You know, I, I think that people forget that pride didn't start with the rainbow flags. Pride started in a lot of pain and in a lot of chaos. In, and in rage. So remembering that I think is really important. And then finessing the commercialism that, you know, these companies are gonna find a way to make their money anyway, for real. Like, I'm really interested to see how people handle this pride season amongst like COVID-19. Um, but if there is an opportunity to finesse something, I always say finesse it. Like for example, this brand out of New York reached out to me about creating a clothing line with different queer artists. And I know them all. I know everybody who's doing this campaign is real down ass people. Um, and 100% of everything that's gonna, that is going towards that clothing line is gonna be donated to organizations that we pick. So that's a project that I chose to do. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that's because I knew that 100% of everything, not just profits, but just like everything was going towards an organization that I hand chose because I believe in the work that they're doing. So, you know, gotta finesse it too because they're gonna make their money anyway. Do you believe that, oh, 
sorry. As of now, COVID-19 cases in the U.S. have reached over a million. Do you believe the media is lacking in reporting how the virus is impacting communities of color? Of course. I mean, the media can barely, mainstream media can barely report the truth in anything, much less things that impact communities of color. So I think it's really important for us as community members and as people with a platform to be mindful, to be um, doing the best that we possibly can while taking care of ourselves to share resources and to share tools with our communities about how the virus is impacting communities of color. Um, but I mean, I see it, I see it everywhere. Um, my partner's family lives in Jackson Heights in Queens and the literal like epicenter of everything that's happening in New York. So I know for a fact that people don't, people are withholding information from communities of color because they're disposable. Do you feel that because of com commercialization that it could lose its sincerity in some respects? Yes and no. When I say yes, of course, anything that gentrification touches loses its value in ethics, but I don't think that it can lose its sincerity in the sense of its meaning and its intention because people literally fought for this in terms of for our ability to exist in a space differently as queer people. Our answer, our queer ancestors did not fight for us to take absolute vodka tequila shots from the absolute rainbow bottles. You know what I'm saying? So I think that that in itself is, they're not the same thing. You know, you're talking about two completely different things. You're talking about the party of pride and you're talking about the history of pride and they're not the same thing. San Antonio loves you. Powerful to see folks of different backgrounds posting your work down here and incredible to hear the story behind it. Thank you so much. I had no idea that San Antonio was putting up posters. So I'm really grateful and excited to hear that. I love Texas and I'd love to come, come down to San Antonio. I went to Houston. Um, I know, I know, but I got to make my way around Texas. Y'all are pretty big. <laughs> so I'm doing my best. Hopefully once the world where it's safe to see each other I'll be making my, my rounds. This has been so awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing this space with me and for creating this, this conversation and for allowing me to speak to you from my living room, which isn't mind blowing. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so powerful and Tell Amy we're a fan of her too. She's <laughs> hey. You're so cool. If anybody doesn't know, it, Amy does so many amazing things, including Veggie Mijas. So y'all should check that out. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I got a two and one in this one. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Oh, wait, Greg asked one more question. Let's yeah. see. Yeah. Do you believe that the current crisis has created disunity in communities of color? Um, no, not overall. I think communities of color, I think communities are gonna, we're gonna take care of each other. Um, and we have always been taking care of each other. And in the grand scheme, I think that that's always gonna continue. I think there's definitely some um, people who are choosing not to, engage in social distancing and to do the things that we should be responsibly doing and that's creating some conflict within our communities but overall no i don't think that there's a disunity because um gente will always take care of gente you know what i'm saying so well if anybody else doesn't have any more questions um we're gonna go ahead and end our event Thank you so much again for sharing space with us. And Thank students. you so much for having me. And we're just going to speak it into existence. One day you're going to be here. Oh, Dr. Ramos has a question for you. Let's let her get one more in then since we have a little bit of time. The Latinx community is so broad. We come from different ethnicities, religious backgrounds, color, socioeconomic classes. In your view, how does one find their place within it? That's a good question. And I think that's something that we, obviously everybody struggles with what does, what's our place within our community, right? Um, because everybody has a different sets of privileges. Everybody has different sets of experiences. And um, I think that it, that's what it comes down to is like, who, 
who are you individually? Um, and what does it look like to be you from an outsider's perspective, right? So um, I think that's, that's the best we can do. Um, and it's hard for me to be like, oh, you just have to go find your community because that's not, that's not the case for everybody. But I think a good start is just to look inside yourself and then to kind of try and see yourself from the outside to, to others. Um, so yeah, I hope that's a good answer-ish. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm here for people to express themselves and to honor their truths, whatever it looks like for them. Not everybody is gonna, you know, be a public speaker or, or a public artist, but I'm whatever it looks like for you to honor your story, I'm really here for and supportive of that. So thank you so much for being here with today and everybody has asked questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Joanna. Um, thank you everybody for tuning in and participating. Uh, we thank you so much for sharing space with us. This has been really healing for me and I know for our students. Um, I really, really appreciate you. So thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You have a good day as well. I'll thank see you. you.